Recording? Yes, we're recording. So you can leave your speakers on today. It's okay. We're just a really small group. And if you want to ask a question, it's okay. But what we're doing is, is we're just going back to the beginning where we started and going through that one more time. Um, and I think the timing actually is perfect for that because um, if you can believe it, there are still rumblings among who we think of as the body. I mean, within the people who keep the calendar and, and um, basically believe more or less like we do, there are still rumblings of um, accusations about things that don't matter. So I think the timing, and, and I know I'm being very, very vague, Vague, but I think the timing is good to start at the beginning again because what I want to show you from the beginning is patterns. So, you know, it's, it's almost as if this is what it's like. Now, Travis, if you're listening, son, you know I love you, and I'm not talking against you. You know that you and I have a divergence in our beliefs, so you know how I believe and I know how you believe. But I'm going to use you for an example, son. My son does not believe in a God that is personal. He believes in God, but he doesn't believe in a God and personal. that's personal. At least the last time we talked about these things, that's where he was at. But he loves these, um, what are they called, sacred geometry, all how the flowers are, are symmetrical and beautiful. You cut open a seashell and how the, the swirl inside is just so and the divisions are just so. He likes to talk about how music makes patterns on the surface of water, how music and sound can make patterns in uh, on, on the surface of sand. All of these things are really important to a, a growing number of people who are connected with nature, but they don't have a relationship with the possessor of heaven and earth. I started using that term a lot because uh, when I was studying Melchizedek, I really liked, I really liked I loved it in that passage. Okay, so I, 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 for a long time, I used it, used the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but there's nothing wrong with that. But I like the term, the possessor of heaven and earth. That just really states a position of, of who he is. So they don't have a relationship with the possessor of heaven and earth. They have a relationship with the things that he made but they don't have a relationship with him. And really, when you think about it, this is nothing new. Let's get into this. I'm gonna to begin to break down these patterns for you. You know, we, we have all of these things people look at. We've got, um, whether it, let's, let's just look at some of them. And, and I'm not saying that none of these don't exist. That's not my platform here. What I'm saying is they're out of order in our lives. We have people who, who study weather control, mind control, the trumpets and the hums that you hear in the atmosphere. There's Nibiru that's supposed to be showing up. Uh, there's another comet right now that's visible on the horizon. Everybody's watching this one. There's asteroids that we're supposed to be seeing here in a short uh, time. Oh my gosh, if the body's not divided off, or whether the earth is round, flat, or dome-shaped, I don't know what they're divided over. So these things that we look at, okay, they're important things, but sometimes we get them in front of our focus and our focus is supposed to be the possessor of heaven and earth Elohim let's look at let's look at some verses that he wrote let's go um, and and the other thing is too I, I do want to say before we look at the verses just in speaking to myself as as one who was more streamlined in my faith streamlined being someone who had come out of Sunday worship and sitting in a congregation in a building, when I would become aware of these things, I would look at them and I would have this feeling of guilt 
because I saw them as part of a worship system for new age people, people that didn't have God. And yeah, that was right. They were worshiping, worshiping them. And I think that maybe that's why that we as believers have a tendency to steer away from these things because we see the groups that watch these things and they hold them up almost as if they're holding the created up in the position that the creator should have. Um, so we kind of steer away from talking about these things and we kind of steer away of, of noticing those things. But let's take a look at some verses. In Deuteronomy, we were warned about making graven images of anything on the earth that flies in the sky or lives in the waters. We're also warned about worshiping the sun, the moon, and stars. It's Deuteronomy 4.16. Lest ye corrupt yourselves and make a graven image, the similitude of any figure, the likeness of male or female, the likeness of any beast that's on earth, the likeness of any winged fowl that flieth in the air, the likeness of anything that creepeth on the ground, the likeness of any fish that is in the waters beneath the earth. And lest thou lift up thine eyes into heaven, and when thou seest the sun, moon, and the stars, even all the host of heaven, should be driven to worship, worship them and serve them. For the Lord thy God hath divided unto all which the Lord thy God hath divided unto all the nations under the whole heaven. Now in the New Testament, in the book of Romans, okay, uh, we see it again being said that Elohim is the one who created everything and that they had gotten off. Let's go to Romans 1.20. For the invisible things of him, Elohim, from the crea creation of the world are clearly seen. So he created them. They belong to him, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Who are without excuse? The ones who don't find him. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. Neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations and in their foolish hearts were darkened, professing themselves to be wise, they become fools, and change the glory of the incorruptible God into an, an image made like unto corruptible men, to birds, and four-footed beasts, and creeping things. That's Romans 1, 20 through 23. So does that mean, does that mean we shouldn't look at these things? Does that mean we shouldn't recognize that Elohim created these things? No, he never says, he never says in the Bible, don't notice patterns and flowers. He never says in the Bible, don't look at the pattern in seashell. He never says, don't notice that when you play music next to the wake, lake, it makes vibrations on top of the water. He never said that. He said, don't worship it. As long as we're looking at these things, and we're in awe of the one who made them, we're fine. Once we take these things and we become more concerned with them or we replace Elohim with them, then we have a problem. So I just wanted to bring this out to you as we get into this that there are patterns throughout the Bible. Throughout the Bible, there are patterns. There are patterns in the words. There are patterns in what the words created. There are cycles in the timings of Elohim. You almost can't not, once you start seeing them, you almost can't not see them. And so that's, that's just a little glimpse of what we're going to get into is to not feel like, like we're into something new here, okay? Because I'm already sensing from the blowback that I'm getting from people that looking at patterns in the Bible is almost like Okay, again, don't mean to step on toes here. 
because for some people it's great for some people they think it's you know shouldn't be done it's almost like when the people are against the equal distancing letters in the torah for coded messages that's the way the patterns have been treated lately is like it is fringe or almost um jamantra almost like that thing where you're putting more into the word of god than needs to be there but i think we're going to see as you go along that you're going to see is that he put them in there for a reason and they're they're not really hidden that once you know uh uh his intent and purpose for putting him in there and you see this it's going to really start opening up the scriptures for you okay so that basically was just the intro so um so from the book of genesis to the book of revelations this is one continual love story it starts in genesis and all through revelation we see that it's a story of love and loss and patience redemption by the messiah and res and restoration by the messiah it's the story of a father's love and loss and reunion with his children and then the great love of the messiah that bridged the way back in the center um, this is a story about an ancient path that stretches stretches from eternity to eternity it's the root of love and life planned out in cycles patterns if you will the way of life for the people actually all people that are set apart to Elohim. The story is about the terms of his ketubah. Ketubah is his handwritten marriage contract with his people that have been called by his name. So some of you have, have most of you understand ketubah by now. If you've uh, been with me for a while, you understand that it's the written aspect of the marriage vows that Elohim and his people agreed together to obey. So this, story started before Abraham with Adam and continued after Yeshua the Messiah. It's here in our day and it will remain in the future. It is not just for the Jew, but it's for all of humanity and future generations. When you find this path, there's rest for your soul. Jeremiah 616 says, thus saith the Lord, stand in the ways and see and ask for the old paths. Where is the good way? And walk therein and you shall find rest for your soul. So it's in these seemingly dry passages in the biblical feast that talks about on the 14th day of the first month and the, and the, the 15th day of the seventh month and count 40 days from when you cut the wheat. And these seemingly dry passages of the biblical feast is where this story lies. And they have been sewn together by the parables that the Messiah told. Um, they were provided to us to know him as he wants to be known. These cycles and patterns, Elohim, and with these cycles and patterns, Elohim gave specific days of worship to be honored on an annual basis. He gave them as patterns of sevens and fifties. The appointments that are for our worship of him are seated in his calendar. His calendar is a system of words, cycles, pattern, and a land connection that are yearly renewals. Okay, so that's where we're going. We're going into this beautiful love story that's all wrapped up and maybe a little bit obscured because we don't live it in the words that we're given. Is there anybody here who doesn't understand the word ketubah, how it uh, means something written and how that... Uh, how that plays into the uh, the writing at Sinai when the nation of Israel married Elohim. Has everybody seen the Colossians 2.14 teaching, I hope? Yes, no? Julie, have you seen Colossians 2.14? I haven't seen that, but I've seen other teachings on it, and I do understand the Ketubah. Okay, great. Yeah, I would like to watch the words. Okay. Um, so basically, hang on, my computer is finding me. Yay. Wonderful, wonderful. Let's see if I can get a hold of this there. Okay. So basically, everything that we're given is part, 
is either part of the ketubah or the story of the marriage or the story of the infidelity or the story of the restoration of the infidelity. And that's what the book is about, about from Genesis to Revelation, okay? That Elohim created man in his image and that man fell. And then he started over with Noah and then we see that Cain and all of the Canaanites in the land of Israel really fell badly to the point to where he used the nation of Israel to kick them off the land. And then we see that Israel fell. The woman that came out of Egypt, the Bible says she never gave up her pagan lovers from Egypt. And the, t the tribes that crossed over into the land of Israel that become the two daughters, they never gave up their mother's way. And then we needed the Messiah to come and restore that broken mess so that we could be married again and restored to the Father. So that's what the whole Bible is written about. The whole thing is this vast love story. And sometimes we get lost in the forest looking at a section of it and we forget that the bigger picture is about love and restoration. Now, Hebrew words are a system of family words. At the foundation of a family word is a root. The root is not a word. It's represented by two or three Hebrew consonants called roots. Uh, and it appears in the text with periods and below each Hebrew consonant. Hebrew consonants are given different vowel sounds to create different words that have similar meanings. At times, consonants can be added to the front or the end of a Hebrew root, sometimes even to the middle, to create a new but related word concept to the family of words. A family of Hebrew words resembles a human family, where we see physical similarities between parents, siblings, cousins, aunts, and uncles. So that's really important when you look at such things as, for example, um, let me pull this up and see if I can do this. Share my screen. And I'm going to write with my little wonky finger on this whiteboard. When you look at such words such as, this is the root. Okay, so in Hebrew it would be dot, dot, dot. Bet, resh, tav. Okay, this parent makes the word. Sorry, lower I get it harder. It harder it is is to write greet, which is covenant, and it makes. Whoops. <laughs> Sorry, guys. One of these days I want to get a real pencil. Barashit. Okay, so you can see here, 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 here. So this is, this is a parent word. This is a parent word right here. And from that, we're able to build other words. Stop sharing. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> so the scripture has a lot to say about covenants. The word for, for covenant is, is greet. The root of greet we just showed you uh, can be, it's, I'm sorry, I did that wrong. Hang on. Let me just do that again because I, I misled you and I don't want to do that. I saw a mistake I met made. So sorry, the, the, actually, this is the root. It wasn't with a uh, tov. It was with an olive. Oops. There, that's, what, that's the root of it. So that's the root that forms these two words. So um, anyway, that, that forms the opening sentences of Genesis too. So Brit and Bereshit, bara, in the beginning God created, both of those share the same parent word, okay? 
So the most straightforward meaning of writ is the action, the application of the words written in the ketubah. Um, that's the most straightforward thing. And we'll get more into that later on, but I'm just hitting on some of this now because where we're going, you need to see this. During the season of love and life at Mount Sinai, when the Israelites agreed to obey the written ketubah of the covenant or the wedding, Elohim expressed his love for his bride when he says they were a unique treasure to him. Now, therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, my breach, then you shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for the earth is mine. In Exodus 24, 12, Elohim has written, and the word is katav, and it looks like this. Katav. Elohim has written uh, the terms of his Brit or his covenant with the people, with the Israelites. And the Lord said unto Moses, come up to me in the mount and be here and I will give thee stones, uh, tablets of stone and the law and the commandments which I have written, Ketah, um, that thou mayest teach them, Exodus 24, 12. It was Moses' job to instruct the people how to live pleasingly with their new husband. Then he, Moses, took the book that the words were written into, the words were written into a book then, the book of the covenant, and read it in the hearing of the people. And that's Exodus 24, 7a. The written terms, the ketubah, the Israelites were to agree to obey were recorded in the previous chapters of Exodus, starting in chapter 19. Again, in Deuteronomy, we're told that the Israelites were set apart from the rest of the world because they, they were set apart because of the love Elohim had for our patriarchs at faith. For thou art a holy people unto the Lord thy God. The Lord thy God hath chosen, chosen thee to be a special people unto himself above all people that are on the face of the earth. The Lord did not set his love upon you, nor choose you, because you were more in number than any people. For ye were the fewest of all people. But because the Lord loved you, and because he would keep the oath which he had sworn unto your fathers, hath the Lord brought you out with a mighty hand, and redeemed you out of the house of bondage, from the, ha from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. So there are a lot of scriptures in the Old Testament that talks about the husband aspect of the relationship that Elohim had with the nation of Israel. In understanding the bricks or the covenant, the marriage, there are signs that were given at different times to the nation of Israel. These signs remember, resemble today's action of displaying the artfully created ketubah on the walls of the home here in Israel. Um, they're beautiful pieces of art. But some of the other signs that were given were circumcision through Moses, the tassel and the blue thread called zitziot, the absence from certain foods. With the ketubah, there came an outward sign that the Israelites were his, much in the same way a woman takes the tradition of wearing a wedding ring in marriage. The wedding ring is a sign that the woman wearing the ring is set apart in marriage to her husband. From the very beginning, the God of Israel expressed himself as a loving husband, a husband who craves and is jealous for the affection and devotion of his wife. He provides her with the exact instructions, ketubah, of how to please him and how to keep his favor in their relationship, their Brit. Now in the Brit Hadashah, which by the way means the new marriage, they were not given a new ketubah. They weren't given a new writing. The words remained the same. Some laws, the work of the temple, were satisfied by the actions of the Messiah. However, we know the terms of the ketubah are still the same because we have a record of first century believers still obeying the terms of the ketubah at Sinai. After the death, burial, and resurrection of Yeshua, evidence of the ketubah is preserved for us in the recorded history of the new marriage, the Brit Hadashah. They were given a new covenant or a marriage to Yeshua, the firstborn son from the dead, the second Adam, in his blood. 
Romans 7, 1 through 4. Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. For the woman which hath a husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. But if the husband is dead, she is loose from the law of her husband. So then if while her husband liveth, she is married to another man, she be, shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law, so that she is no longer adulteress, though she be married to another man. Therefore, my brethren, you also are dead to the law by the body of, uh, uh, see, by the body of Christ, that you should be married to another, even to him that is raised from the dead. So they were dead to the law by the body of Christ, but they were going to be married to another, Yeshua, who was raised from the dead, so that they should bring forth, so that we should bring forth fruits unto God. In our new marriage, in our new Greek to Yeshua, our outward sign, which by the way, the, sign, the word for sign is oped, our outward oped for the world to see that we have entered into the marriage or a breach with him is our love for each other. A new commandment I have given you that you love one another as I have loved you that ye love one another. By this all men know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. So that's what we're looking at when we're looking at the New Testament is we're looking at a new marriage. The terms of the marriage, the vows that were exchanged as, as we looked at in the Colossians 2.14 teaching, they didn't change. There was a basic, Exodus talks about, there was a basic requirement for the husbands in, in, in the law when they took a wife and that was food, and, shelf, and, and clothing and uh, offspring. That was the basic wedding contract, the basic covenant for every marriage in the Old Testament. And those things haven't changed. What is it the Messiah said uh, in the New Testament to his disciples? He said, why are you like the Gentiles, worrying about what you eat? You know, he, talk, he, says, he says, look at the lilies of the field that, that are here today and gone tomorrow. Even Solomon in his glory are not, are not clothed in more splendor than they are. The sparrows of the air, do they, they don't worry about what they eat. They don't toil. So he's, he's making this list that you see in the, the basic requirements for marriage. He's making this list to his believers of don't take worry for this they'll be provided for you. So we have a, a new ketubah, not, we don't have a new ketubah, we have a new marriage. We good so far, guys. You have any questions? Going too fast, is everything okay? I just found it really interesting and it was brought up to me a while back about, um, I was told a breed means the word. I don't know if that's wrong or right. Um, then the the combination of the British, like England British, and that Brit or Brit being the dis, you know what they're called, and that there's a possibility that they were a lot of the lost tribes of Israel just because of maintaining that name, and I I found that interesting too. So when you were talking about the word you know, Breit, that just kind of went through my mind again. So I didn't... Why there's that whole replacement theology from the that British line of... of uh, yeah, that would explain a lot. I didn't know that. That's interesting. Okay, so this is very, 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 very basic, but it's going to be really important to build on these patterns. And as we build on these patterns, they're going to get bigger and I can bring more things in. So how does the scripture de describe a day and the Sabbath rest? In the creation story, we can read seven times how a day is known. And the phrase is, and the evening and morning were the first day. We find that in Genesis 1, 5b, Genesis 1, 8b, 
Genesis 13, Genesis 19, Genesis, uh, I'm sorry, start over. Genesis 1, 5b, Genesis 1, 5, 1, 8b, Genesis 1, 13, Genesis 1, 19, Genesis 1, 23, Genesis 1, 31. So we're told that evening and the morning were the first day. And for the Sabbath, it says, and on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had made, and he rested Shabbat, that's the word rested, on the seventh day from all of his work, which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in, because in it, he had rested Shabbat from all of his work, which God created and made. That's Genesis 2, 2 through 3. So a biblical day begins in the evening, and finishes when the evening of the following day arrives. Now, Elohim numbered his days rather than giving his name, giving them names. The seventh day was the day when Elohim rested. He blessed it, blessed and sanctified the seventh day. Since then, in Israel, that's the only day that we have that has a name, and it's called Shabbat. So basically, we say Yom Rishon, Yom Shadi, Yom Shishi, Yom Revi'i, Yom Hamashi, Yom, you know, so we have, we're literally saying day one, day two, day three, until we get to the seventh day, and we say Shabbat. So, I mean, if you call it the seventh day, or if you call it Shabbat, I'll leave that up to you, but he only numbered them one through seven. The seventh day, okay, is Friday evening and Saturday day. This, that's when that's when Shabbat is Friday evening and Saturday day Saturday evening is the beginning of the first day so there's something that we've been shown clearly in the creation story it's very interesting and I don't know if you've ever caught this but the Sun does not bring evening and morning the scripture plainly says that Days one through three, evening and morning came to pass before the fourth day. Why is that important? Because in days one through three, the sun, moon, and the stars had not been made. And yet we have evening and morning in days one through three. So the sun, moon, and the stars are not responsible for evening and morning. The sun, moon, and the stars were created on the fourth day. If for three days, evening and morning happened, but there was not yet a sun, moon, and stars placed in the sky, then these things do not bring forth the dark and the light. So some people like to point to the fact that God's light and disagree with the, with the day beginning in the evening. They don't understand that when a day starts in the evening, it doesn't start in darkness. The sun is actually still visible. And we're gonna get into this later on, um, that one of the traditions that we have picked up, and I have found some stunning, stunning historical evidence of what I'm going to tell you that I didn't have the first time I went through this, and, and I have it this time. One of the, 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 the traditions that we have picked up is that we believe that a day begins at sunset. It doesn't begin at sunset. It begins before sunset by just a little ways. Um, so we're going to take a, a really in-depth look at that in, the, in another section of the book where it's the, the reason and the meaning is really going to come to life. I can explain it to you now, but when I explain it to you in context of the mystery and why it happened that way, it's going to really come to life to you. Um, just remember this as we go along. If something looks out of place or out of order in the scriptures, such as a day beginning with a descent into darkness, there's, then there's probably a prophetic reason behind it. Elohim is the God of order, and he presents his order in patterns. When he wants our attention, he changes up the patterns so that we will notice a spiritual connection to the prophetic. We will see some of these, and I'll point them out to you as they come up. Okay, so everybody, that was clear that I'm literally seeing, saying to you that the day, the new day begins before sunset. I just want to say that plainly. 
we, we will be going into it, probably not this evening. Hopefully in the next session we'll reach that point. But I can, I can show you in the Word of God and prove, you in, prove it to you in the, the historical writings of the first century as well now that the day began before sunset. So how does the scripture describe a month? Beginning at day one of the creation story, Elohim establishes a strong thread of understanding throughout all of the scriptures that he is light and his light or life brings order for darkness and chaos once, once reigned. Genesis 1, 1 through 4. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. This earth was without form and void and darkness was on the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, and God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, and it was good, and God, God divided the light from darkness. This is the order, the Hebrew word for order is Sidur, uh, by Elohim as being the only God, the only El, that brings light and order into darkness and chaos. It's a pattern, it remained a pattern in the New Testament where we're called sons of light. Whether the redemption happened in the creation story when chaos and darkness ruled the face of the earth until the appearing of the good light in Genesis 1, 3 through 5, or it happened in the gospel story in the New Testament, the sign of Elohim is light. 1 Thessalonians 5, 5, you are sons of light and sons of the day. You are not of the night nor of darkness. John 9, 5. <laughs> As long as I'm in the world, I'm the light of the world. Ephesians 5, 8 through 13. For you were sometimes darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth. Proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. And have no fellowship with unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. For it is a shame to even speak of those things which are done of them in secret, but all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light. For whatsoever doth make manifest is light. We read that the lights in the skies would, among other things, mark the appointed time of worship to Elohim. Elohim is further enforcing the idea of his light shining on earth, causing darkness to be divided from the light, as in the opening chapter, opening verses in chapter 1, when he said, light be. Genesis 1, 14 through 15, and God said, let there be lights in the firmament of heaven to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and seasons. Seasons is moedim, times of worship and for days and years, and let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth. And so it was. We know his sign is one that divides what was previously in darkness with the appearance of light. It's now easy to see or better understand that the presence of a new crescent moon after an average of two days without a light or moon in the night sky or the dark sky would be a sign of Elohim. Elohim, who is the God that brings order and light into darkness and chaos. Any sign that did not include light would not be a sign from Elohim. Many believers struggle with the understanding on how to observe the biblical month or year with the signs we've been given to understand in Genesis. The answer lies not only in the words, but also in the simple pattern we've been given. A dark sky, or conjunction is void of light and would not represent the God of light. An equinox gives equal equality to night and day or darkness and light and is not his signs. These signs would be contrary to his character he displayed for us in creation against the patterns of his word that he is a God of light. Okay, so I know we're touching a little bit on the biblical new year, new year, new year here, but uh, we will explore it more in depth later. Hang on, I've got a lady wanting to join the chat. Let me see if I can help her. There we go. So basically what I'm saying is that God has established himself as a God of light. He equates goodness to light. He equates evil to darkness. 
So any sign that begins with darkness or that begins uh, that, that begins with a lack of light would not be his sign. First thing he did in Genesis was to create an atmosphere of light. Okay, so when we, when we look at um, the beginning of the month, then we need the appearing of light in darkness. So, this is, this is what I talked about, a conjunction, and I talk, talked about an equinox. Here is the terms, the uh, definition of them. A conjunction is, in astronomy, is an apparent meeting or passing of two or more celestial bodies. The moon is in conjunction with the sun at the end of and the beginning of a new moon cycle. When the moon moves behind the earth and the sun, they are in conjunction. At this phase, the side of the moon that is facing towards the earth is dark. In other words, it cannot be seen. Equinox is the time when the sun crosses across the plane of the earth's equator, making night and day of approximately equal length all over the planet. This happens twice a year at the vernal equinox or the spring equinox and the autumnal equinox or the autumn equinox. So, Using either the conjunction or the equinoxes as a mandatory sign to begin the year would be contrary to his character that he displayed to us in creation. They would be against the pattern of his words and that he is a God of light that separates and conquers darkness and chaos. Now I'm not saying, like I've said about the other things, I'm not saying that the conjunctions and the equinox do not, do not happen. I'm saying that they are not his signs to us. That's specifically what I'm saying. Okay, let me look and see if I need to let anybody in since it's a one man show today. Nope, we're still good. Now we're gonna to go to a scripture verse. First John 1, four through six. And these things we write unto you that your joy may be full. This then is the message which we have heard of him and declared unto you that God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. And if we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. Okay, in Hebrew, there are two words for moon. And I'm gonna, since I'm gonna try to write these for you, hang on. Share. My Lord, clear this. The word, oh, sorry, that's a yud. It's a little close. Let me clear that. There's yerech, and there's the word. Aka, can you just say what those letters are? Yud, resh, chet, chet, and chet, dalet, shin, chodesh. Okay, thanks. Hang on, let me see here. Okay, I'm good so far. Okay, let me clear that. So, the word Yerik is l the literal name, proper name of that object we look in at the night sky. Okay, that's Yerik. Um, when I'm watching for the new moon, and, and this happened this time, I'm out there, you know, I'm looking through the camera and trying to get that photograph and these two guys pulled up behind me. He said, and he says, Alan, as they say, always say Alan. That's it. And that's actually a, we've picked up a lot of um, Arabic slang. Alan is Arabic for hello. How are you? You know, like, how you doing? Whatever. Alan. I said, hi. You know, and he says, want to know what I'm doing? I didn't say, I didn't say, uh, uh, 
Chodesh Hadash. I didn't say, I said Yerik Hadash, Tamunach Yerik Hadash. I'm taking a photo of the Yerik Hadash, the new moon. So if I would have said Chodesh, he would have think, thought, you know, he may have known, he may have known some biblical Hebrew and the significance of it, but it would have been a strange thought to him. So the word Yerik is literally that object that you see in the night sky. The word Chodesh relates to the biblical calendar. Actually, Chodesh is uh, from the same root word as holy. Okay? So when we say Chodesh, we're literally re referring to the holy calendar of Elohim. And there's many. I'm sorry, Becca. Yeah, go ahead. Question. So Chodesh, what you're saying, that means moon. That's what you're saying. But it, means, means, huh. it applies specifically to the biblical calendar. Okay. The holy calendar. Well, Yerek means like, it's like the noun that we need, that we say. It's like saying moon in English. And is Yerek that word found in the Bible or is that mostly a modern word? Yes, it's found in the Bible. Okay. Yeah, it sure is. Okay, so let me get this away, move this over. So the word Chodesh is the name of the moon as it relates to the biblical calendar, the biblical months, and the timing of Elohim. It's used many times in scriptures as an indicator of the first day of the month in Elohim's calendar. The word Chodesh, constructed from Hebrew word, means to repair, renew, or restore. Okay. When a moon is seen anew after two nights of a moonless sky, the moon appears very low at a very low illumination, generally a little over 1% to 3% of its whole surface is illuminated on the first night uh, that it can be seen with an unaided eye. It'll look like a sliver crescent, a silver crescent sliver in the night sky. But as it begins to repair, restore, or renew itself, and those are all correct words. And when you, when you hear the word new in Hebrew, it can really literally mean not just something that was created in the moment that's never existed before. It can literally mean repair, restore, or renew. So as the, new, as the moon begins to renew itself, the orb will fill in day by day for two weeks until the moon is filled in or full. So I'm going to try to share with you um, a photo of a new moon sliver. This is a new crescent moon sliver. This uh, is one of my, actually one of my photos. And uh, actually, this was pretty large illumination. I believe this was between, this was definitely over 1%. I think it was around 2% illumination on this night. Okay. So the new moon swallower is also known as a sickle moon from Wikipedia. A crescent shape is a symbol or an emblem that you used to represent the lunar phase of the first quarter, the same moon, or by extension, a symbol uh, re representing the moon itself. The first quarter is the first week of the moon phase. In this period, the new crescent moon, the simple moon, is at its closest point to the Earth, where it's reappearing in the night sky. So can I get you guys to mute, mute yourself unless you want to ask me a question because I'm getting a little feedback on my end. Yes. The new crescent moon in the first quarter has the appearance of a sickle for harvesting grains. And I can't tell you how important this is for where we're going. If you want to understand the first fruits, if you want to understand the three go up feasts, you have to understand that every one of these events are counted from a sickle moon. Okay, I mean, I can't, this sounds like such a simple trite thing at this point, but you really must understand, we count from a harvesting sickle 
moon. Okay. It's from the sickle moon that we count the days to the harvest of the barley in the week of unleavened, matzot, an appointed time of offering thanks to Elohim. From the sickle moon, we count the days to Passover. From the sickle moon, we recognize the Feast of Trumpets. From the sickle moon, we count the days to Yom Kippur and Sukkot, uh, the Day of Atonement and the Feast of Tabernacles in the seventh month, even counting to the eighth and final day at the end of Sukkot. From a prophetic perspective, many think of Sukkot as the last harvest or end gathering. I want to share a screen with you after I read you this little bit. There's an entry on page 263 of Genesis Hebrews Chaldee Lexicon to the Old Testament. It's a very old book that shows that the word for new comes from the root chet dalet shin, which is a root that refers to a sharpened, a sharp, splendid, polished sword. And I'm going to show you this really quick. Quick, I think I better diminish the size of my screen right here. Yeah, I do. Here we go. Actually, have this little portion right here. So, this is that lexicon right here. Also, to polish a sword, it's in the same family as Hod. Let's see, I can't read that. Hadach and had, Hadar, Hadar. And the significant expression of newness appears to proceed from that of a sharp, polished, splendid sword. And then they give us the reference of 2 Samuel 21 16. So I'll stop sharing that. So. Oh, I, no, I should probably keep this open because I've got several photos I want to show you. Hang on. Um, hang on. So this is, uh, this next photo right here is what I believe is our connection to a sharp, polished, splendid sword. Now, please bear in mind, he's not so shiny right now because he's from... 13 to 1275 BCE. This is an Assyrian sickle sword. Okay, so as early as 2000, 2500 to 2400 BCE, there are reliefs of this king who was over the Mesopotamia re region where Abraham journeyed from when Elohim called him, and also the area where it was believed the Garden of Eden was to have been located of sickle swords. Why is this important? It's important because we're going to see that Elohim talks about his polished, shiny, sharpened sword. If we look at this relief right here from 2500 to 2400 BCE, we see a sword in his hand, and in this hand, we see a sickle sword from 2500. That's a long time ago. Now, this sword was from David's era. This is the Egyptian Kopesh sword. And again, it's a sickle sword. Okay, let's start sharing that. And I'm going to just pause a second and try to address a question that's being asked of me so I don't forget. Okay, so does this type of a sword relate to the story of King David buying the threshing floor of Ornan the Jebusite? I think our answer is yes. Historians say that David lived circa 1035 to 970 BCE. Uh, it's poignant that the Hebrew lexicon ties hadash to sword, and they give a reference to it in 2 Samuel 21.16, which is about David. Now, these some of these Hebrew words, I'm going to take it slow. And Ish Bibinonab was the son of the giant, and the weight of whose spear was 300 shekels of brass in weight. And he being girded with a hadash, sword, 
thought to have slain David. So this passage is about it as as about a guy that was uh, the son of a giant, and there was a period of time when David was his 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 presence was not known. I think it was when he was staying with the Philistines and he was hiding from Saul that they thought that this giant had slain him with a hadash sword. Um, so Ishi bi Benonab was got was girded with a hadash and was thought to have sl slain David with it. Now we're going to follow David to the book of First Chronicles, where we find that David had counted the people because Satan had provoked him. Chronicles 21.1, Elohim sent Gad to speak to David. Hang on. Uh, hang on, let me just pause again, read that verse. First Chronicles 21, 9. And the Lord spake unto Gad, David's seer, saying, Go and tell David, saying, Thus saith the Lord, I offer thee three things. Choose one of them, that I may do it unto thee. So Gad came to David and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Choose thee either three years of famine, three months to be destroyed by thy foes, while that the sword of thy enemies overtake thee, or else three days of the sword of the Lord. Okay, we're going to start seeing the sword of the Lord. Even, pestil even, the pestilence in, even the pestilence in the land and the angel of the Lord destroying throughout all the coasts of Israel. Now, therefore, advise thyself what word I should bring again to him that sent me. David threw himself on the mercy of God. We're going to go to 1 Chronicles 21, 13 through 16. This is some of those patterns that, that, that we're, we're looking straight in the face, okay? We're not looking at them as if they don't belong to God and as if he didn't build them and if he's not using them for an intent and purpose. But they are still patterns and things that people see as mysteries. David said unto Gad, I am in a great strait. Let me fall down now in the hand of the Lord. For very great are his mercies, but let me not fall into the hand of man. So the Lord set pestilence upon Israel, and there fell of Israel 70,000 men. And God sent an angel unto Jerusalem, Jerusalem, to destroy it. And as he was destroying, the Lord beheld, and he repented of the evil, and said to the angel that destroyed, it is enough stay thy hand. And the angel of the Lord stood by the threshing floor of Ornan the Jebusite. And David lifted his eyes and saw the angel of the Lord stand between heaven and earth, having a drawn sword in his hand, stretched out over Jerusalem. I love these patterns. Then David and the elders of Israel, who were clothed in sackcloth, fell upon their face, fell upon their faces. Well, guess what? David's going to purchase now the threshing floor of Ornan. This is First Chronicles 21, 7. And the angel of the Lord, and the, and the Lord commanded the angel, and he put up his sword again into the sheath thereof. At the time when David saw that the Lord had answered him, in the threshing floor of Ornan the Jebusite, when then he sacrificed there. Okay, there's another verse in here that tells us that when David bought this threshing floor, Ornan was threshing wheat. That's so important. If you know what the wheat seed of the Word of God is, if you've been with me for my my teaching about the the the, the, the second species. Um, then then you know what then you know that this is very important hang on i'm going to try to fix this real quick okay so so it's been going now so david bought the threshing floor from ornan the jebusite which by the way was a canaanite he bought it from ornan the jebusite when ornan was threshing wheat and remember elohim was looking over Jerusalem and he repented himself for the evil. So now I'm going to do a screenshot with you, with this little little guy right here. Let me get it centered. All 
right. Okay, this is Mount Zion. Up here's the Temple Mount. This is, uh, I forget the name of this tower. This was one of the towers. This is the tower where supposedly where the, uh, the Greeks held up uh, by, the, by the temple and, and uh, defiled the temple. This is later where during the destruction of Jerusalem where some of the uh, Jews, uh, you know, stayed when Rome was uh, trying to come through the wall. This was a stronghold. Uh, they found the ruins of that there. But I want you to look here in this photo, the shape of Mount Zion. It's the shape of a crescent. Okay, stop sharing that. So, Mount Zion is where the temples of Elohim once stood. It's a double peaked crescent shaped ridge. It is sickle shaped. It is where the city of David was located. The word Zion means uh, a monument or a guiding pillar, a sign, a title, a way mark. Isn't that interesting? Before David, Elohim had spoken to the nation of Israel in Deuteronomy 32 in what's known as the Song of Moses. Deuteronomy 32, uh, verse 39. Now see that I, even I, am he, and there is no God with me. I kill and I make alive, I wound and I heal, neither is there anyone that can deliver out of my hand. For I lift up my hand to heaven and I say I live forever. I whipped my glittering sword and my hand take hold on judgment. I will render vengeance to my enemies and I will reward them that hate me. I will make my arrows drunk with blood and my sword shall devour flesh and that with the blood of the slain and of the captives from the beginning of revenges upon the enemy. So here I'm going to share it with you. That's the crescent moon from this month. I'm going to think it goes, I think I'm going to go into this a little bit later, but while I've got this, when the crescent moon, when the new moon sliver appears, this is the one night in its whole cycle that is the closest to the earth. Every month that can be different. It, it can be different. I find that in the well, towards the end of the year, let's say after month six, that when the new moon appears that first night, it's always very, 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 very close to the earth like it is here. And it's always very large. The sickle is very wide, but it's very narrow. Okay. So the next night, the moon is going to be way up here off the photo. It's going to be so high. It's not even going to be it wouldn't even be, you wouldn't even be able to catch it, capture it in this photo. So this is from the, I'll just leave this up. This is from the sixth biblical month, according to the witness of the seven species in 2020. Uh, on the night of the new moon, the sickle of the moon rests at its closest location to the earth. Uh, this following photo is from a previous year. In both photos, the relative size of the new moon is larger than it is in the rest of its cycle. So you see how low this new moon is to the horizon right here. This is a sickle moon. <clears throat> Sharing that. Is it possible that the sickle moon and the sickle sword are related? Yes, it's very likely and just like Elohim, especially when we understand a Hadash sword and a Kodesh moon share the same Hebrew word, root. A sickle moon or a new moon sliver can represent not only a sickle sword, but a harvesting sickle. Zion's shape remembers the disobedience of King David and the mercy of Elohim when Elohim stopped the angel from destroying Israel. The new moon sliver also represents the first day of, month, of the month. Both the remembrances, both remembrances are preserved in Jerusalem on Mount Zion. 
In the first month of the year, at the appearance of the sickle moon, we count the days for the barley harvest, the first harvest of the year. From this perspective, we can see the new moon sliver as a cutting apparatus, as it is shaped like a sickle with a splendid, polished, splendid appearance. So because we're counting to a harvest, we can see, from this perspective, we can see the new moon sliver as a cutting apparatus, such as a sickle. Um, let's see. I'm going to... So there's a section in Mount Zion uh, that's on the compound known as the Old City next to where the Western Wall is situated. It's an archeological park and there are currently some very interesting discoveries going on in that location. Throughout the Torah, Elohim made it clear if the nation of Israel was firmly, firmly and faithfully covered by his Torah, his Ketubah, they would have prosperity and peace in their land. Think back on the stories of when they were in the process of possessing the land. Israel took the Ark of the Covenant and the high priest into battle with them. If Israel was in right standing with Elohim, they won. If they were disobedient, they lost. The book of Samuel chapter 4 describes a battle when Israel was defeated and lost possession of the Ark of the Covenant. When the Israelites won a battle, it was a sign that Elohim was truly fighting for them. If they weren't firmly and faithfully covered by, with his Torah, then they were dealing with the sword of their enemy and lost the battle. This pattern was visible when the Israelites went in to possess the land of Canaan. It was evident when Israel failed to evict the inhabitants of the land of Canaan as Israel was forced to defend their position in their God-given property. It was Elohim who fought for them or Elohim who fought against them. So that statement is relating to the sword of Elohim. All right. We're going to go to Joshua 24, 20. If you forsake the Lord and serve strange gods, then he will turn and do you hurt and consume you. After that, he hath done you good. Isn't that what we just read in, in about David with Elohim that sent his angel, sent his angel on the people with a sword? So... Okay, so we've previously talked about the position of the moon in the sky when it's, locate, when, when it's in the location of when it first appears. So I want to bring out another aspect of understanding of this event. Um, at this moment when the sickle moon appears, and it's at that closest location of, on the earth, uh, and the next night, it's really high in the sky, okay? So, so... I, 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 I'm going to try to describe. I'm going to try to describe this to you. If everybody will hold your hand out, I'm going to teach you how to sight a moon. Just hold your hand out like like me, okay? So normally these are these are degrees, okay? This is how we measure degrees on a, on the horizon. One finger is normally five degrees, okay? So normally when a new moon appears, it's two to three fingers above the horizon, okay? The second night, I can't even get all my hands in. The second night, this is how high it is above the horizon. It's all my fingers spread. So you've gone from something that's here to, that's the second night, all the way up here. So. So from the perspective of the amount that the moon is going to move in 24 hours, we can understand that that first night begins the count for the harvest. Um, the book of Revelation is giving us another clue that the new moon is a harvesting sickle and that it is an indicator of harvests for the calendar of Elohim. And we're looking at, um, Revelation 14, 15, and another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, thrust in thy sickle and reap, for the time is come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. Now, this is a picture. I did not take it uh, in the article I wrote on this. I gave credit to the website, but man, is it a great capture. Um, 
This is a sickle in the night sky, and I'm going to show it to you. And you're probably going to say, wow, like I did. That's some sickle, huh? That's some sickle moon. Look how low that is on the horizon. Now, if we're counting from the sickle moon when it's against the earth to our day, towards our harvest, and by the way, by the way, there's not one harvest date that doesn't fall in that one harvest date at the end, one harvest date. There's all of them, but one date falls at a time of the first quarter when the moon is still in the sickle shape. Okay, so we have another biblical word with patterns to look at. Uh, in English, okay. yes. Sorry, I just have a question. Which one is it that doesn't fall in that time? The, uh, Sukkot. Sukkot begins on the 15th day. It begins on a full moon. Okay, thank you. Uh -huh. So we have another biblical root word with patterns to look at. It's in English, it's the word sickle. In Hebrew, it's the word magal. And I'll write it for you. So it's mim. Gimel, Lamed, Magal. Okay. Uh, Magal, I bought a Magal last year. In fact, I still have the Magal. Magal is a word we use in modern Hebrew still. Magal comes from the parent word. Go here, whoops, stuck on, didn't mean to stop sharing. Share screen again. Here's the parent word. That's the parent word. And that parent word is galgal, which means, I'm sorry, that's no, that's not the parent word. The word for the root, this root forms the Hebrew word, which means will or circle, galgal, skull, bulgotha which Strong's tells us that Golgotha is a reproduction of Golgal, a skull as round, uh, by implication a head. Okay, so this Golgotha, which is really in the New Testament, Golgotha. Okay, so follow that. The sickle moon is a Magal. The root word forms the word Galgal. In fact, when I get car tires on my car, I get gal gals. Okay. It also is the word for forms the word for skull, which in Hebrew is gul gal f gul gal f. Sorry. Strong's tells us gul gal f is the reproduction from gal gal, so it also means skull as in round. When we read about gul gal f. In the Brit Hadashah, it's now called Golgotha, Hebrews 27, 33. And when they came into a place called Golgotha, a place of the skull. Here's where it gets really interesting in my, in my opinion. So the full circle or the full moon, the Golgol, okay, also shares symbolism with the Hebrew word for skull. Why? Yeshua offered himself on Passover on the 14th of the first month at a full or nearly full moon at the place of Golgotha or the skull. Did you follow that? If we take the moon from the sickle to the full, it's a gal gal. It's a wheel. It's a circle. It's a disc. It's full. On the 14th, we've counted 14 days forward, and that moon has been filling in. It's no longer a sliver. It's now completely restored, renewed, and made full. On the 14th, under that full moon, at the Golgotha, the full now sickle, 
Messiah laid down his life. Can I add something that came to mind really quick? Sure. Uh, this is bringing Goliath to mind. These words and the head and the fact that he beheaded Goliath with his own sword. Yeah, exactly. yeah, that would that would be like look in, in the in the in the Bible. There's uh -huh. always, there's always what God has that is good, and then the uh -huh. enemy always comes up with a with a bad counterpart. Yeah, yeah. So you know, one of the big ones that we'll get into here in a little bit is the fact that not all leaven is sin. You, if you when you talk to most believers. They think that the Bible indicates that all leaven is sin. Well, there's, yeah. there's a parable that says that the kingdom of God is like leaven. And we know the kingdom of God's not bad. So yes, there anything that God created, the only thing that the enemy can do is make a twisting of it and make mm -hmm. something it was never meant to be. Then it becomes spoiled, ruined, or bad. So yeah, sure. Sure, I can see how we can look at uh, that symbolism of Golgotha, uh, of Golgotha, and look at Goliath and and David. David killed him with a slingshot. He didn't kill him with a sword. He did cut his own head off with with his, with his own sword. Uh, yeah. yeah, I can see some of that. I've got. I just um, this is bringing to mind, and maybe you're going to talk about this later, and maybe not. But this is a verse I wrote down a long time ago that I didn't. I stand and that I've been trying to search out but it's Hosea 9 15 where it says all their wickedness is in Gilgal is that the same Gilgal it's after there I hated them for the wickedness of their doings we, we have several Gilgals across Israel actually okay um a lot of like like we have uh there's the Gilgal Gal of Rephim right up here would be north and east of me up towards uh actually you have to have an appointment to go in there because it's a military zone and it's a great big circular wheel made of stones up there uh, so we have we have several historical locations that refer were referred to as gilgals which one that's referring to i wouldn't know unless i went back and, and looked at the scripture and see what he was talking about but the thing is, is when you read Gilgal, understand it's a wheel. You, you find the word Gilgal in Ezekiel. Ezekiel, at the beginning of Ezekiel, he talks about the will within the will. Those are Gilgals. Okay, that the full circle or the full moon also share symbolism with the Hebrew word for skull. Yeshua offered himself on Passover the night of the 14th at a full or nearly full moon at the place of the skull. When counting to Elohim states that represents days, times of worships by the moon phase, we can't arrive at the nearest position to a full moon. Okay, so this is going back to when we start the count, okay? When counting the days of Elohim's dates that represent times of worship by moon phases. You cannot arrive at the nearest position to a full moon by counting from the dark moon. If you do that, you're not going to have a full filled out moon in the sky. Okay, so you can't count from the dark moon, dark of the moon or the absence of light. To be able to number 14 days and rest against the gal gal or the Golgotha, the circle or the skull, you must begin the count on the new crescent moon, which is the sickle moon. From the book of Genesis to Revelation, we are given more than just words. Those words, words are demonstrated on the land of Israel and in the life of our Messiah, Yeshua. They are brought to life with the patterns and cycles of the biblical calendar. Now, this is the final, one of the final things I want to bring out about uh, the crescent moon. And finally, the horns. Does everybody know what the horns of the moon are? Let me see if I can get a photo here. Push this back up real quick. Okay. 
Okay. Can't grab it. Can you see it? I, I don't, I can barely see it. It's there we go. Oh, okay, yay, did it. These are the horns, this tip and this tip. These are the horns. What's interesting is that when the sun set, sets, the sun's going to come down and it's going to go in a, in a westwardly angle. It's going to come down at a diagonal descent like this. And as it does, the light that's reflected from the moon is the side that the sun is setting on. Okay, so why is that important? Because that means that the horns of this moon are always going to point in the direction that the sun rises. It's going to point east. Okay. So what you need to remember is that a new moon sliver has east facing horns. I'm gonna go back to this location over here. Okay. So now the most interesting thing for me is that the new crescent moon faces eastward, its horns point east, eastward. Um, when we look at Mount Zion, and I, and I won't bring it back up for you because the orientation of the picture is actually, actually upside down when you think about north, south, you know, east and west, it's actually upside down. So it'd be confusing, confusing. But when you look at Mount Zion, what would be the horns of Mount Zion point eastward, just like the new crescent moon that I observe in the night sky. You know, um, <clears throat> if it wasn't, if it was pointing westward, it would be the waning moon. It would be the moon as it was fading into darkness. But Mount Zion has eastward pointing horns just like the new moon. Um, these two situations are not coincidental. These are the patterns of Elohim. He just, his words are displayed on the land of Israel. And then we learned really recently about uh, uh, Bet Yerik, okay? Uh, I don't think Whitney knows about this location, but there was a teaching from last week on my YouTube channel, Whitney, that you can catch up about that year. Uh, screen share here with you. So, Bet Yerik. Um, hang on, I want to let somebody in. Let me see if I can find her. Oh, hang on. We'll abort this. Just a second. It's getting kind of Okay, so Elohim actually gave us a second witness for the new moon sliver. And this is a very ancient tale just by my house, right at the bottom of my hill on the western shore of the Sea of Galilee. It faces east towards Syria. And this is not a very good rendition. I don't have the aerial, aerial view. I looked for it, I couldn't find it. But this is a crescent-shaped peninsula that used to be completely divided off by the, the, by the Jordan River on the backside and the Sea of Galilee on the front side. And it has, uh, and, I, and I do apologize, this is a horrible rendition. The aerial view shows the shape of the crescent much better. But it has horns that face east and it is a natural formation that Elohim made on the land of, on, on the land of Israel. Um, and he left us two patterns here in the land of a crescent-shaped moon, naturally occurring by him. All right. All right. I'm gonna pause again, I'm gonna to try to help Ella. Oh. 
So how does the scripture describe the, the beginning of the year? Throughout the Bible, Elohim has just demonstrated to the world when his annual cycles start or when his year begins. Our problem is we have missed or overlooked his patterns. Sometimes it happens because we no longer understand agriculture. Sometimes it happens because there's been a lack of understanding and experience in the land of Israel. In the last instance, the body of Messiah has lacked a believer to share the land Bible connection with them. This disconnection has caused a loss of understanding of the scriptures that are written in an agricultural language. This agricultural language was written about a specific piece of real estate in the Middle East. This tiny piece of real estate is unlike any other nation outside of this specific region known as the least. So we'll develop the idea of Elohim demonstrating the head of the year or the beginning of the year, even from creation. But for now, I want to read, what? okay, yay, I see her, she's there. Admit, good, though, no, she's in, okay. Um, hi, Ella, yay, you made it. And by the way, we're recording, just so you know. Um, but for now, I want to read to you where Elohim reintroduces the Israelites to his calendar as they're leaving Egypt. So it says, this month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year, Rosh Hashanah. It literally says Rosh Hashanah. It shall be the beginning of the year to you. Exodus 12, 2. This day when you came out, the month of Abib, of, of the month of Abib. That's Exodus 12, four, uh, 13, 14. And most Bible translations, the, uh, the passage in Exodus calls the month by the name Abib. But in Hebrew, the scriptures literally say in the month of the Abib, which is a huge difference. Because if we say Abib, we're calling something by a name. But if we say the Abib, we're describing something okay we're naming something abib is not the name of the month it is the name of something that was to happen or appear in the first month of the year abib is an agricultural term that describes the developmental condition of cereal grains the first cereal grain uh, the first cereal grain mentioned in the worship of elohim is barley the first month of the biblical calendar is determined by the maturing of the barley. The barley was needed for the first fruits offering on wave sheaf day, which happened in the week of unleaven. The week of unleaven is one of the three yearly, uh, three times yearly that the nation of Israel was told to, report, to appear before Elohim. In these passages, we read that the nation of Israel could not appear before Elohim at the temple empty. Empty of what? Devoid of an offering from their harvest. There were seven species, and we'll get into more of this later, but there were seven species, and they were the only acceptable first fruits offering in the temple. Seven species off the land. Of course, there were the animals and, and the firstborn sons of Israel, but I'm talking about from the land. There were seven species. To Elohim belong the earliest part, the earliest and best part, of all of the crops from the seven species. They are called, the earliest and the best are called the first fruits. Exodus 23, 14 through 15. Three times a year you shall keep a feast to me in the year. Thou shalt keep the feast of unleavened bread. Thou shalt not eat unleavened bread seven days if I commanded thee in the appointed time of the month of, that should say, the Abib. For in it thou camest out of Egypt, and none shall appear before me empty. Exodus 23, 16, the feast of harvest, the first fruits of thy labors, which thou sow in the field, and the feast of ingathering, which uh, is the, uh, the wheat. The feast of harvest is barley, the feast of, uh, sorry, the feast of harvest is wheat, the feast of ingathering is Sukkot, uh, which is in the end of the year, which thou gathered in thy labors out of the field. Uh, Exodus 23, 17, three times a year all thy mill shall appear before the Lord. Deuteronomy 16, 16, three times in a year shall all thy mills appear before the Lord thy God in the place which he shall choose in the feast of unleavened bread, the feast of weeks, and the feast of tabernacles, and none shall appear before me empty. So the reason we have to have the beginning of the seven species 
to start the biblical calendar is because he would not, did not want us to appear without the first fruits offering before him on these three go up feasts. Abib or Aviv in the agricultural, is, a, is an agricultural term relating to a specific stage of barley development for grains. It is a stage of development that the barley was struck with hail in Egypt. So this condition called Abib in Hebrew, Aviv in modern, in modern Hebrew, in fact, now in modern Hebrew, the word they, they picked up the idea of a spring, which we don't have a springtime like you think of springtime, that they use the word Aviv to mean spring. So it was during this condition of the barley being in the state of Abib that the hell struck Egypt. It says in Exodus 9:31, the flax and the barley were smitten, for the barley was in the ear, but in Hebrew that says Abib, and the flax was boiled. It's in the book of Leviticus that we learn the term Abib applies to the earliest acceptable condition of a grain offering. Leviticus 2.14, if thou offer a meat offering of thy first fruits, meat is always a, not, not animal, it's always a flower offering. If thou offer a meat offering of thy first fruits unto the Lord, thou shalt offer the meat offering of thy first fruits, green ears, which is a beeb in Hebrew, of corn dried by fire, corn is grains, or corn beaten out of full ears, and that word is carmel, Leviticus 2.14. So with these scriptures, you can understand that it's really improper, honestly impossible, to start the calendar of worship to Elohim without an acceptable barley offering. Okay, so we had to have first fruits to take to the temple. Can you do me a huge favor? Sure. Can you go get the aloe on my table? <laughs> huh? You talking to me, Nancy? I Okay. <laughs> anyway, okay. <laughs> it's, it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> okay. That's going to happen. Okay. So, so why, why was it, why could we not appear before him without first fruits? Why was first fruits so important to him? It was our covenant promise of prosperity. Okay? If we didn't have what to bring him, it was a sign of our disobedience. And we better not be, be appearing before him in that state and appearing before him with empty hands as well. Can you mention how barley is what's the unleavened that we eat instead of like the matzo crackers you get in the grocery store during the week of unleavened bread? I'll mention that now and we'll get more into that later, later okay. in the question, but I'll be happy to mention that now. So, um, when we see that, uh, so, so first of all, we're talking about first fruits offerings. That's the first thing you've got to focus on because I, I know what a lot of believers do and I know what the Jewish people do. And, um, but you, but it's because either they don't understand a first fruits offering or they've lost sight in the case of the Jewish people, they've lost sight of the seven species and which one belonged to which feast. So when we're told that we're not to consume leaven during the week after Passover, it's because the wave sheep that we're offering is of barley. So the week of unleavened was unleavened barley and not unleavened wheat. Um, in fact, when you read, and, I, and, and we'll go into this, so I'm just going to say this generally, and we'll get into it in a future recording, because I've got all these scriptures, 
But when you look when the Israelites walked out of Egypt, Egypt, it said that they had no time to prepare food. They used the word victuals, and that they only walked out of Egypt with these unleavened cakes. Okay, so the idea of unleavened bread, when you look at the King James word for unleavened bread, you'll see unleavened is in regular type, and bread is italicized. Bread, the italicized word means that bread has been added to the text to give the previous word meaning. When you so take away, take away, throw out bread, throw it out. King James put it there. Elohim did not. So the actual word that it is is we're not to eat matzot. I'm sorry, we're, we're to eat matzot. We're not to eat anything that has leavened in the barley. I'm not doing a very good job of this. I understand that. But because we're dealing with the feast of barley, the, the thing that is not leavened is the barley cakes. When we get to Shavuot, now we're dealing with a wheat first offering. Shavuot is a wheat first offering. Pesach and leaven is a barley first fruits offering. Okay, so what was not leavened for the week of unleavened was the barley. When you get to Shavuot, guess what they're offering? Two leaven loaves. Two leaven loaves. Okay. These. Uh, are you, I'm sorry. I just have a question. Sure. So, are you saying that during the week of unleavened bread, you? are supposed to eat unleavened barley so there's nothing like you don't necessarily need to throw all the other leaven or you just that's exactly what i'm saying and we're going to get into that and i'll, I'll prove it to you historically in the word of god I, I can prove it to you in the word of god it has been one of the most confusing events in the new testament um and and I, I can do it now, but I'm going to make you wait because, because I need to build your patterns, okay? But if I did it now, you're going to get lost. If I continue to build these patterns for you and, 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 and show you how he works these things, you're not going to get lost. I am, as, I am absolutely telling you that you need to throw out all leaven barley during the week of unleavened barley, okay? It's not illegal to eat your wheat products from the year of the previous harvest. It's illegal to eat your wheat products before you've given your first fruits offering. Okay, it's illegal to eat your barley before you've given your first fruits offering. Can I add something to that that's coming to mind? It's almost like he's wanting, because with Elohim, like he works with, um, a remnant or a tithe of everything, right? Yeah. So the way I understand it is through every season and every harvest, he's wanting a certain amount of a remnant that is basically getting the teaching from him, strictly from him, and, and the old teaching needs to be like cleansed out. Like how it talks about cleanse out the old leaven so that you become a new lump. Okay, so I understand it. he doesn't want like a defiled remnant. He wants. It, it's basically, in a nutshell, barley represents all humanity. I know we're not that far ahead. Uh, you're, you're kind of getting a picture, but basically barley represents humanity, all humanity. And I, and I don't want to get too sidetracked on this, on this today because we're going to get into that. So, uh, keeping think of it as the thing we're all fallen at him that's basically humanity okay mm -hmm. 11 barley equals the sin of our father adam mm -hmm. okay and i'm just going to leave it there for today and as we develop it okay so that's why we practice for those seven days these adam bodies these barley bodies from our fallen father adam it's no longer created in the image of God, who, who is eternal, who, who, who sinned in the garden. Okay, so they we were given these human bodies that are going to fade and die now. 
okay? These are barley bodies, okay? That's a, our symbol in the, in the Bible. So keeping the leaven for seven days is keeping the sin out of our lives. Remember, there's, there's, there's barley the night of Passover, right? Mm -hmm. okay. That's Messiah. He was the sinless son of man. Mm -hmm. That was his barley symbol that night of Passover. You had the lamb, you had the bitter herbs, you had the unleavened barley then. Okay, then, then after that, after the Messiah's offering, now we in our human barley bodies are empowered to keep the leaven out of our lives. Mm -hmm. Um, if you look in chat, Becca's, uh, there's someone that has a question. Their mic won't work. Oh, sure. What food do we have that has barley in it that we should be avoiding? But So, Ella, I don't believe that eating barley, uh, if it's, you, you, you can eat barley in any form during unleavened bread, or during unleavened, just, I mean, Almost, almost in our, almost in our society, it's something we don't have to worry about. How many stores do you go to where you can find barley in the bread? I mean, I don't see barley as a bread commodity on a regular basis, even in Israel. It's, it's, you just don't see it. You see it. Uh, I, I had a lady here from, uh, I want to say Norway and she made barley bread and brought it. And it was just before Passover this year, so we had to hurry up and eat it and get it out of the house. But you might see it in some of the European countries, but as a general rule of thumb, you're not seeing leavened barley in the stores. So, but that doesn't negate the command that we are commanded to eat leavened unleavened barley cakes during the week of unleavened. And we'll get into this. I know we're getting way off track. We'll get into this, but this is the one time when we have this rest that we're told that we can cook that which we must eat. And what must we eat? What does the scripture say? It says we have to eat unleavened or we're cut off from our people. So he gives his permission on the beginning of the seventh day, seven days, and on the end of the seventh days, seven day to cook and make our unleavened barley cakes. Yeah, so eating wheat matzah, Ella, those, those crackers, those Manischewitz crackers they sell in the store is not fulfilling the command of unleavened. So and I guess it just seems like this is really important because of, there's like three things that are a sign and the Feast of Unleavened Bread is one of them. Right. So in order to be doing that correctly, you have to make your own barley cakes, basically. I do, yeah. You, I think you can buy. I think there are places online you can buy barley flour if you, if you, uh, uh, you know, on the ball, and you can order far enough ahead of time. Um, I, I, fortunately, I have a, a meal, and I, I can make my own flour here. I can get barley grains on the grocery shelf. But yeah, it's it's really easy if you, and and we'll get into some of this later. It's really easy to do. It's basically just hot water flour, and you're patting out like a tortilla. You're going to cook it like a corn tortilla. You've got another barley cake right there. You can make it as thick or as thin as you want, and um, yeah. We fried ours up every night after I used Becca's recipe and I couldn't find barley flour. I could just find the pearls and I took it home and I put it in the coffee grinder. It was a little messy, but it worked. And it was our first week of unleavened bread. I felt like we were doing it right. And it was so special and it actually tasted really good. I thought it tasted better than the monza tasted. I like the taste of it. I like the taste of it. Yeah. Okay. So let me catch up on the chats here. Uh, so of a regular base actually lists barley also. Okay, so you make sure you read your labels. Um, eating is matzah is not for the, yeah, I love matzah. You can eat matzah. There's, there's, look, eat matzah if you like matzah. There's no command not to eat wheat matzah. Uh, but the, the command is a positive one to eat un, unleavened 
which would have been from the barley because it is the first fruits offering that's associated with Passover. It's the first grain that's ripe on the land. So I just, I'm sorry. I don't have to go through my cabinets and throw out everything that has you. Is what you're saying? No, isn't it lovely? You don't have to go. You don't have to throw out. You don't have to throw out. Look, you don't have to. <laughs> we'll get into this. Okay, I promise. And this is a huge. I know. I used to throw out my pasta even because it had flour in it. <laughs> yeah. I, I've always... Becca, I have a really quick question that's real important. Yeah. Um, you know, we're doing a little bit of light gardening and stuff here. And we've eaten from some of our first fruits, which was just some squash and zucchini. It's making me feel guilty. Um, but we're getting eggs finally from our ducks and our chickens. So I'm trying to gather up a dozen of those. Um, my mother-in-law is a widow. Uh -huh. Is it okay to bring what first fruits I can gather to her? Well, there's no temple. I mean, uh, you know, right now we're the tabernacle. We're lively stones built, making up a spiritual building for Elohim. So if you, if you, especially if you know a, um, I believe in widow, um, you know, something, yes, give it, give it to an individual. That is so crazy. We did that yesterday. Our neighbor's a widow. Yeah. Wow. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Becca. You're welcome. Wow. You're welcome. I mean, that's, that's who, when you went to the temple anyway, a portion of it went to the strangers, the widows, and the orphans. So you just taking care of them the way we're commanded to do anyway. All right, so let's see if I can get back on track or maybe we're done for the day. How about we end here? I, Ella, I apologize that you had such trouble getting in. I hope next time it'll be easier. How about we end here today and I'm going to convert this to a YouTube file and I'll post the link to the chat group so you guys that came in late can go back through and see it. Um, basically, we'll pick up at this point, probably the week after next, because the other group that's further ahead than you guys, and you, you guys are welcome to join next week, but it just won't be a continuation from here. Uh, probably next week, I'll be talking about uh, the pomegranates, I think. I think. We'll see what God does. I'm still studying that. The pomegranates and the olives and some of those things. But you're welcome to join in on that. Then the week after next, I'll pick up where we ended today and try to catch you guys up with the rest of the group. Does that sound good? Does mm -hmm. anyone have any more questions about today, about the things that you've heard today? Everybody understands the, the pattern of the new moon and, and it being a light that appears in darkness and how it represents. Um, let's see. So Ella, every Saturday at 9 a.m. Uh, your Central Standard Time in the U.S., which is 5 in the evening here for me in Israel. Um, it's almost 7 here now. PM. But every every Saturday morning, we'll be doing it for a while until you guys catch up with the rest of the group. So next week, it'll be Saturday morning at or 9 a.m. for you guys. And now that you've got that link, you should be able to come right on in without any trouble. Um, so yeah, so you got the pattern of the sickle moon. You understand that, that it's a symbol of the sword of the Lord. We, we, you understand that the, the Mount Zion is a, the shape of the new crescent moon. Uh, he left us two signs on the earth. Uh, what else? What else do we need to talk about? Anyway, we'll get into some really fun stuff next week. Um, and we'll call it good for this week. Unless there's any questions. Any questions? Okay, I'm going to stop the recording. <laughs>